Great, so let me introduce everyone to uh, Rose Yu. Uh, Rose is an assistant professor at UC San Diego uh, in the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. Uh, she was a postdoc fellow at uh, CIT and earned her uh, PhD in computer science at USC. Uh, her research focuses on advancing machine learning techniques for large scale spatiotemporal data analysis with applications to sustainability, health, and physical sciences. Uh, particular emphasis is on physics guided AI. And uh, she's won faculty research awards from Google, Amazon, Adobe, and several, uh, uh, and has several best paper awards, a best dissertation award from USC, and was nominated as one of MIT's rising stars in EECS. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, I would love to, to hear uh, Rose give her presentation. Oh, thank you, Keith, for the kind introduction. Um, yeah, I did my postdoc at Caltech. It's, I guess it's not very, I haven't heard about CIT as an acronym before. That's okay, but I did my PhD at USC. So, so most of my study have been around Southern California and it's great to be back like virtually and talk about our work. Um, so I'm currently assistant professor at UC San Diego and also in SoCal. Um, I direct the Spatial Temporal Machine Learning Lab, and this is our lab logo where you can sort of spot out a, a SNT in this logo, and obviously there's a rose in it. Uh, so SNT stands for Spatial Temporal Data, and that's our focus. So speaking of Spatial Temporal Data, uh, there are a lot of examples. One of them is the pandemic. So we can see that the transmission of disease is highly spatial temporal. And if we can make forecast of number of deaths, hospitalization or cases, it will significantly help inform public health decision-making. So uh, that's an, one of the example. And the other example is in the field of climate and in climate science simulation models are often used to project the future climate temperature. Uh, so this video shows the temperature variation for the past 50 years. Um, so simulation models have been uh, accurate, but not very efficient. So our goal here is to hopefully design machine learning models, leveraging observational data and speed up the simulation. So as you can see, uh, these two examples kind of point to the same direction, which is to learn the spatial temporal dynamics uh, from public health to climate science, to actually many, many different fields in science and engineering, such as traffic, transportation, uh, sports analytics, et cetera. The common pattern is that data generated from these domains contain very rich and spatial and temporal information. So what I mean by spatial temporal, learning spatial temporal dynamics is that you know, given space and time data collected uh, from different domains, we hope to build a machine learning model that can make predictions of this kind of patterns that evolve over space, over space and time, whether it's forecasting the number of cases for the pandemic or whether it's forecast the temperature variations of the climate. So uh, what's different about a spatial temporal data compared with the traditional data used in machine learning, such as uh, images or text data Spatial temporal data actually are governed by physics, right? They're on the line physical system that also often generate this kind of data. So it's very natural that we wanted to integrate physics as a principle with machine learning. But overall, physics and machine learning actually provide complementary strengths for modeling spatial temporal data. From physics, uh, you know, it uses first principle methods uh, like law of physics to describe the evolution of space time patterns. Uh, physics models are model based, right? They're based on physical laws. There are a lot of tools in physics, such as tensor network. And this is what I did my PhD on differential equations, uh, which are set equations that describe the dynamical systems and symmetries, uh, which is intrinsically describes a lot of interesting symmetric phenomenon in physical patterns. So all these tools have been developed in physics and they, are, they can describe the data quite efficiently. Uh, they also encode our domain knowledge 
about the data. So they're very sample efficient, meaning that they can you know, predict or infer with very few data points. Um, but sometimes these physical models are computationally expensive because numerical integration. And oftentimes, because of these numerical assumptions that we have to put into the physical model, uh, they can be far away from real world data and leads to the model misspecification problems. So then in machine learning, we take a slightly different approach, right? We often, you know, perform statistical inference and develop data-driven models. So in machine learning, we also have our own tools such as graphical models, uh, neural networks, or deep learning, or variational Bayes, which is a type of optimization method for inferring intractable likelihoods. Um, in machine learning, you know, because we're learning from data, so the models are relatively realistic, uh, they're quite efficient, um, but unfortunately, current machine learning, especially deep learning, requires a lot of data to learn, right? Think about AlphaGo developed by DeepMind to solve the game of Go, and the machine basically have to see millions of examples in order to learn to play the game of Go, but for humans, we're extremely sample efficient. So how do we you know, make machine learning methods more sample efficient? That's the big challenge. Another aspect of machine learning is that sometimes it doesn't predict, you know, it doesn't generate predictions that are physically meaningful because uh, they are statistical inference methods. So if without explicit constraints, they cannot guarantee, for example, conservation of energy, which is often necessary for scientific applications. Now, since I talked about both approaches for modeling space-time data, it is very natural that we can combine the best of two worlds together. And that's uh, uh, the theme behind physics-guided learning. So essentially, when we want to integrate first principle methods and data-driven models, we can encode inductive biases encoded in physical laws, symmetries, or differential equations. Uh, we can improve generalization, meaning like the model that's trained on a certain distribution of data set can perform well in the on-sync data. Most importantly, we can reduce sample complexity so that our machine learning models can learn quickly with a few examples. Um, and finally, if our make predictions can guarantee to be physically meaningful, then we can also increase our trust in AI, right? There's a lot of discussion now about the biases and you know, potential mistakes of AI, which is you know, really a frontier challenge right now. So in today's talk, I will briefly discuss uh, some collection of work that we have been doing. Uh, I clustered them into two groups uh, to provide a more principled methods to integrate physical principles into machine learning. Uh, the first group is what I call the trainable operator. So um, in this case, what we're trying to solve is the forecasting problem, right? So let's say I have a simple time series from x1 to xt. So there are t timestamps, and each of xt can be of a high dimensional feature vector. Uh, if I want to make prediction, which is often a task in machine learning, uh, we de typically define a functional map, f, which maps from the input data, xt, to the output data, y of t. Um, and uh, sometimes, if we wanted to encode our domain knowledge, we will constrain this function map, f, to be a mathematical operator. And uh, an example for that is a Laplacian operator, right? So this Laplacian operator acts on the input data x by computing the convolution of the signal f of t using e to the power of minus next t. So trainable operator just means um, this operation is a convolutional operation, right? So if we can parameterize this function f of t or filter f of t with a you know, network, then we can make you know, this operator itself trainable so that we can learn more flexible you know, operations within the family of mathematical operators. So that's kind of the, the key idea. So 
just to give you a couple examples of how we can use this kind of idea for forecasting um, spatial temporal dynamics. Uh, the first uh, example is COVID-19. Right, so this is a screenshot from the CDC a couple of months ago. And basically, this is the national forecast ensemble. I believe there is a group from USC as also participating in this um, you know, forecasting ensemble club as well. And our team is here, right? So you, you see a CNU, that's our team. And the team actually includes uh, our grad students, Alan Wu and Mike Scow, and our collaborators, EMA from UCSD Data Science Institute, and our collaborators at Northeastern, uh, led by Professor Alexandra Mastiani, who is a very well known computational epidemiologist. So let's, let's first formulate this problem of COVID 19 forecasting in a more mathematically rigorous way. Right, so let's say I have a system. So the system can represent, you know, the entire country of US or the global system, right? So the system is evolving over time and we call this evolution give a name as state. Right? So the, 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 all the observations at the system at time t is xt. And it has some parameters that we may or may not know. Um, Usually we can describe this kind of dynamic or system using a set of differential equations. Uh, so each of them is can see I and I is the index of the differential equation. And this equation depends on a couple of different terms, the state of the system xt, uh, the velocity of the system, which is the first order derivative, the xt dt, and you know, second order derivative, which represent acceleration. And it has some parameters by which we may not know. So this is basically the governing equation for most of the dynamical system, not considering the noise. Uh, if we want to learn from data, right, we typically observe a sequence of states, uh, x1 to xt. And our goal is to learn a model f, which maps the past sequence x0 to xt into the future sequence xt plus one to xt plus h, where h is our forecasting horizon. Uh, in the COVID-19 case, we're given past you know, few weeks of pandemic or few months of pandemic, and we're forecasting four weeks ahead, which is the requirement for the CDC forecasting hub. So when we look at the problem of COVID-19 forecasting, it is important to capture both the spatial and the temporal dependency in this time series. Because if we look at the US map, the, the number of cases of one state is actually highly correlated with the number of cases in the other states because of the travel. Similarly, there is very complex temporal pattern, which is the, you know, basis the number of cases over time. And you can see that it is not a stationary distribution, right? Because various factors, including lockdown and vaccines. So how can we design deep learning models that can capture this type of uh, spatial and temporal dependency? For temporal dependency, we use you know, this kind of standard architecture in deep learning uh, based on sequence to sequence, right? Given us past the sequence x0 to xt, and we want to generate the forecast xt plus one to xt plus h. And here we're using the encoder, which is a multi-layer you know, recurrent neural networks and to encode the input sequence into hidden dimensions. And then we pass the last hidden state H of T as the initial state for uh, the decoder. And then we use decoder to generate the predictions X1 to XH. Right. So mathematically, if we have the state of the system XT and we use a recurrent equation to map the state XT into the hidden state H of T, Right, and this H of T is recurrent because it also depends on the hidden state from the previous timestamp. And the output of Y of T, which in our case is, you know, the future forecast is a nonlinear functional map from the hidden states. So in this kind of model design, there's, you know, a lot of flexibility. You can either pass the last state into the encoder and that become the sequence to sequence model. You can also compute alignments between these two type of 
a hidden state which becomes the attention mechanism used in transformers. Um, but this is not the contribution of our work, right? So our contribution of work is to model spatial dependency. So if we think about spatial dependency for images, we treat them as a regular grid and we can model them with CNNs. But for pandemic, because every location is in our case is a state level model. So every location you know, is distributed not as a regular grid, but rather as a graph. So in order to model this type of spatial dependency, we used a previous paper of ours, which is called diffusion convolutional RNN for modeling road network traffic. And um, this is a paper from with uh, you know, also researchers at USC, Cyrus and Yam, and I call it 2018. So in similar ways, ways we think epidemic is a diffusion process on an irregular graph, where this graph is the travel graph. So we have the content network between different states, and we have basically a kind of calibrated network that connects the nodes, and the nodes are basically different states. So what we wanted to do is to forecast the number of cases for all the nodes together by leveraging their inter, you know, interrelationship in this network. So diffusion convolution, in essence, is a convolutional operator for directed graphs, right? So if we have a graph, uh, we can represent it as a GenCNC matrix and AIJ is basically the distance between two nodes. And in this case, it represents the travel distance between, I mean, it's rather the contact network, right, in this case. And then with adjacency matrix, we can calculate the row sum and the column sum, which is the diffusion, you know, basically the indeed degree and arc degree matrix. So uh, we leverage the results, which characterize, you know, the relationship of diffusing diffusion operator, right? So that's the mathematical operator that we want to approximate. So the diffusion operator itself can be, you know, written as infinite summation of parameterized random walk matrices. So D of O is the out, out degree matrix and D of O inverse times A is called a random walk matrix. So when we raise this random walk matrix to different powers, it represents different steps of random walk. So this is essentially is a formula for approximating the diffusion operator on a discretized graph. Um, and before, you know, the parameter theta, which governs the speed of the diffusion is usually specified priori, but our idea here is that we can learn this mathematical operator by parameterizing the, the theta with neural networks. So we propose diffusion convolution, which we take the state of the system at time t, x t, and we convolve that with a convolutional neural network. In this case, we use the parameter theta, uh, O, which stands for out degree matrix weights, right? and the theta i, which stands for the in degree matrix weights. And then we use x t as an input for the current timestamp. XT in this case for COVID-19 is the it's a, it's a concatenation of the number of cases for all the states. And uh, this operator essentially exploit the spatial dependencies using the network information to convolve over all the features on the nodes. Okay, but that's not the end of the story, right? When dealing with COVID-19, another challenge that is different from traffic forecasting is the data is actually very sparse. So we we'll only have a couple hundred data points um, because the number of cases is reported on a weekly basis. So we actually first started out with this pure black box model on um, the performance were not so good. So in order to deal with this type of sparse data issue, we can actually you know, combine our prediction with the Gleam prediction Gleam prediction is, you know, a simulation from our collaborator uh, uh, Alex group. So it is a stochastic simulator that integrates, you know, airport network, commuting network, and population network, which, uh, which basically is off on, based on, you know, very complex uh, stochastic differential equations. 
So what we're doing here in the end is to actually predict the difference between the GLEAM prediction, which is a, a mechanistic model and the observational data. So instead of directly predicting uh, the observational data, which is very sparse and the performance not very good, we're actually just using our deep learning model to predict the correction term in the simulation model, because there's a lot of unknown factors in the pandemic that are not accounted for in uh, the current simulation model. And in addition, there's a lot of uh, noise and then in the observational data itself. So, and that's how we hypothesize that using a deep learning model can help simulation mechanistic models to correct this type of bias. So at essence, we propose this hybrid model where we take you know, the historical features, which are the state of the system over different timestamps. So this represents the concatenated number of cases for different states, right? And then we also give the network a sequence of networks. So this represents the travel graph um, between states. And then we use a kind of similar encoder and decoder architecture, as I mentioned before, and the only difference in our model is that we're not using a vanilla recurrent neural network, but rather using a diffusion convolutional recurrent neural network to basically exploit the graph information. Okay, so then if we, and you can check out more of the real-time dashboard uh, on, on this link, which shows our weekly forecast on the uh, UCSD website. So in terms of forecasting accuracy, but just to know how much you know, correction can help, we compare the Glean model and this hybrid model. And we can see them uh, most of the times for one week to three weeks ahead prediction, we did learn this correction term about two points, right? For three weeks ahead prediction. And we try to understand uh, what is happening. So we also looked at, you know, the uh, visualization for number of deaths over different weeks. So this vertical line is the forecasting starting point, right? So what we can see is that you know, the ground truth is this solid line in blue, and then the orange line is the hybrid model. The green model is the one in green shown here, right? So you can see that, you know, for the forecasting period that we're looking at, the green model, which is the stochastic uh, mechanistic model, it has certain bias compared with the ground truth. So the deep green model, which leverages deep learning, uh, learns the correction term, so it fits better with the ground truth, and therefore we have the performance improvement, right? And then um, this is just to show that, you know, um, learning the mathematical operator and combining that with mechanistic model helps, right? Another important question we need to address is the uncertainty of the forecast. So uh, in this follow-up paper but in, called Deep Glean, which is an archive, it describes a detailed formula for how we can generate probabilistic forecasts using deep learning. Because a lot of the deep learning methods, including our own diffusion convolution RN, is a deterministic model. So in order to generate this kind of forecast with confidence intervals, we need to actually innovate on the techniques as well. So in this paper, we talk about different type of uncertainty quantification methods and among them, one of them is a frequentist method called quantile regression. This is directly predicting the quantiles of the forecast, which given the, it calculate, it basically trains the model with a different loss function, which is called pinball loss, showing here, instead of the mean absolute error. So the pinball loss is basically given an interval for a certain confidence level tau, and then it, calculate the difference between the ground truth y and then the prediction y hat using this pinball loss function. So for different confidence intervals, it will generate different confidence, like uh, different confidence level tau, it will generate different size of the intervals. So another method that we used is from our collaborators EN. So basically it's called stochastic gradient MCMC. It's a Bayesian method for quantifying the uncertainty in, um, in forecast. And in this case, we use SGMCMC in the deep learning. The idea behind this is actually quite simple. In stochastic gradient descent, right, which is a go-to method for optimizing deep learning, 
we have the weights at the current iteration, WK, right, being updated using a stochastic gradient, which is the gradient of the loss function with respect to the current weights. And we have a tilde on it because we're not calculating the gradients using all the data, but rather a small sample of the data or batch of data. And that's why it's called stochastic gradient. The idea behind SGMCMC is saying that during this gradient updating step, we can inject a Gaussian noise, P of K, and then with certain design of the P of K, it will converge in a Markov chain kind of language, it will converge to the true posterior of the probabilistic distribution. So you can check out more about SGMCMC by, you know, EMS papers. He's a big expert on that, right? So then if you compare these two type of uncertainty UQ methods for COVID-19, we're showing the weekly death for US as a whole and different states, Texas, California, Florida, Arizona, and et cetera, right? In general, we can see that this model can, you know, kind of follow the trend of the, you know, kind of ground truth quite well. More importantly, it can provide the correct confidence interval for um, the future forecast. So usually what we see is that the Bayesian methods provide a more narrow, uh, more narrower confidence intervals because of the kind of the posterior inference part, right? It's a Bayesian method. It provides a narrow interval, whereas a frequentist-based approach often gives a much larger interval. So that's about COVID-19. Um, so then for, you know, continuing the story of training mathematical operator, right here, we're learning the operator of diffusion on the discretized graph. And we also extended this idea to a much more challenging problem of forecasting turbulence. And this is the paper uh, published at KDD last year. So in this paper, what we wanted to do is to emulate the dynamics of a very complex turbulence known as the Le Bernard convection. And we want to study this actually for the you know, purpose of climate science, because this represents two types of fluids of different temperature, cold in blue and warm in red. When they interact with each other, it will generate very intricate patterns. So um, this resembles the dynamics of El Nino, right? When a warm fluid interacts with a cold fluid, create a very weird climate phenomenon on the earth. This is a joint work with um, my PhD student, Ray, and our collaborators at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. So again, the key idea here is to learn a mathematical operator where we propose a hybrid learning framework. We first look at what has been done in the CFD community or computational fluid dynamics community where I try to understand what are the methods used there. Uh, it turns out there are a lot of different methods that have been used, but largely can be grouped into uh, a few categories. One of them is called Reynolds averaging or RANS. So in this case, RANS computes the temporal averaging of a fluid field, right? Given uh, the velocity W over space X and time T, so with some slight change of notation, X here now is not the state of the system, but rather state, the, the space. Right, space and time, and then we have the velocity field over space and time. So RENS decouples this field into two components. The average component, which is W bar, computed as a temporal convolution using a convolutional kernel and the residual. And similarly, there's another method called large eddy simulation, which decomposes velocity field into a spatial average W tilde and the residual. So the idea behind this type of method is essentially leveraging the multi-scale phenomenon in turbulence. So in this picture, we can kind of measure the energy of different turbulence over different wave number, right? So large waves is on this side. So you have see like large scale eddies. Small eddies, small waves is on this side. It has short, like lower energy. By decomposing the fluid fields into different compartment, uh, different components, where model their energy or their skill separately, right? That's the key idea. So our model, which we call turbulent flow net, is essentially leveraging the idea that, you know, REST LES is basically not, nothing but the temporal or spatial convolution, right? And this type of uh, mathematical operator can be parameterized by deep neural networks. 
So we use, uh, you know, spatial filter, this G1 can be approximated by a neural network, similarly for a temporal filter. And that leads to our model, which we call the turbulent flow, flow net. Right? In this model, what it does is that given the velocity field, W, it passes the velocity field into a spatial filter, which is a multi-layer convolutional neural network. So it will generate W tilde, right, which is the spatial component, and then it will generate the temporal component using another temporal filter. And this temporal filter is also a multi-layer convolutional neural network. Then we model the separate, the residual separately. So for each of the components, right, representing multi-scale decomposition of the velocity field, we can model them separately with different encoders. And we use a shared decoder D to capture the interactions across scales. For each of the component, the encoder and the decoder D, it basically becomes a unit, right? So if you're familiar with unit, it is a multi-layer convolutional architecture with residual connection. And it allows us to model, you know, the multi-scale behavior in the turbulence patterns, also reducing the gradient vanishing problem. So, okay, so this is our model and we evaluated our model on uh, RBC simulation in 2D. So this is the RBC René Bernard convention in two dimension with Prado's number 0 0.7 and Reynolds number 2.5 to the power eight. So if you, are, if you have some knowledge in turbulence simulation, you will immediately recognize that this number is falls into turbulent regime. So this, you know, this fluid is actually quite turbulent. Um, the way you can understand 2D turbulence as opposed to the 3D turbulence I showed in the beginning of this part, uh, the 2D turbulence is a similar when you, like, when you put like milk into your coffee and you look at the coffee cup, you will see like tiny eddies on the coffee. Uh, so that's 2D turbulence. Right? So then here we are basically trying to forecast the future evolution of turbulence, obviously, because turbulence is a chaotic system. It is impossible to forecast in the long, long term. But the goal here is to, for the short term, we can replace the complex numerical simulators, which usually take months to generate a single simulation, right, with our trained deep learning model. So in this setup, we are given uh, 60 times step ahead uh, in the past, and then try, try to forecast into the future to approximate the underlying dynamics. Okay, so here is the prediction performance, right? This is showing a normalized number in terms of room mean square error, the lower the better, compared with different forecasting steps. So we're forecasting zero to 60 times step ahead prediction. And this, in this data, it corresponds to three eddies, three eddy times for this turbulence. And uh, we compared it with TFNet is our model in blue. We compared it with uh, UNet, GANs, ResNet, convolutional LSTM, because these are state of, I mean, it were kind of state of the art gold standard for forecasting spatial temporal uh, data in a regular grid. And these are pure deep learning methods. And SST on deep hidden physics model, these are uh, models actually incorporate similar philosophy as physics informed or physics based. So DHPM is actually a paper from George's group at Brown on physics informed deep learning where they use the differential equations themselves as a loss function in the deep learning. Uh, SST is a recently published uh, I clear paper about forecasting uh, fluids and they use the Green's function idea and try to linearize the equation in certain ways. So you can see that, you know, these two type of physics informed methods have their own limitation, right? One is they have linearized the equation, which is clearly not true for Navier-Stokes equations. And the other one use the equation as the loss function uh, is actually sometimes have the overfitting problem because it requires the initial bound initial condition at every single time for forecasting, the initial conditions are not available in the test. So we can see that, you know, the TF net is relatively stable when we forecast into the future 
for multiple timestamp. Um, but that's not the most important part, right? We want to accelerate turbulence simulation. For a regular simulation, it usually takes several months. Um, so for this turbulence, we compare with the numerical method, which is called lattice Boltzmann method that was used to generate the simulation. We can see that TFNet is roughly obtained two times faster than the lattice Boltzmann method. And it is promising. Uh, since this paper, we have been actually able to extend this framework to a three-dimensional turbulence at 512 cube dimension and compared with the numerical method, we have obtained the several thousand speed up and it's a workshop paper published at iClear a couple of days ago. Okay, then in terms of the forecasting performance, right, it's not enough just to measure the prediction uh, RMSE because we're predicting a physical dynamic. Um, so it is very critical that we need to measure the physical consistency of our predictions. So how can we know that? There are several metrics that people use in the turbulence community to evaluate the physical consistency of these methods. One of them is mean divergence, right? Because this turbulence is divergence free. So that means the divergence should be close to zero. And then you can see here the ground truth data, which is the target is close to zero, right? There are some small gaps because of numerical uh, error. So the closer to zero, the better, right? We can see that for mean divergence, our method is most physically consistent. It has the lowest uh, mean divergence error where other deep learning methods that do not incorporate physics, right? Or not based on, you know, trained operator, they just cannot generate physically meaningful predictions. Another important plot is the energy spectrum of the turbulence. So energy spectrum basically tells us how the energy different scales of the turbulence appear uh, in this simulation. And this is also known as a Kolmogorov scale plot, right? So the solid black line is the ground truth and that's calculated from the simulation data. And we also know from first principle that roughly there are two theoretical curves that govern the slope of this Kolmogorov scale decay. So this scale plot basically tell you how quickly you know, the energy decays at different scale. Uh, compared with all the you know, deep learning model, UNET and ResNet right, in red and UNET in purple, our model in blue, the TFNet and the variation of our model constraint TFNet has the closest energy spectrum error to the ground truth. And that basically validates the idea of using a physics informed methods to pre predict physical dynamics. Whereas the traditional video prediction methods would not be able to capture the physical properties of this data. We can also look at you know, the predictions from our model, right? I mentioned this is a 2D Rene Bernard convection. So what you should expect to see is a two dimensional vortex evolving over time. And it's a circular pattern, right, on a 2D surface. So you should expect to see, you know, kind of circular two circles evolving together um, on the 2D plane, right? So, okay, let me play the video for you. The top one is the target. And, you know, this is the prediction from our model, TFNet, ResNet, and GANs are the predictions from our baseline model. So the ground truth is you can see that there's very intricate patterns resulting from two types of vortex interacting with each other, right? And then let's look at the predictions from our model and we can sort of capture, you know, this large scale circular patterns with some intricate small scale dynamics, but it's not 100%, it's not perfect, right? But this model is much faster in terms of simulation uh, compared with the numerical method. If we look at the pure, you know, sort of deep learning method, right, what you see is that they are basically learning the average pattern where, where turbulence, you can, it loses, it lost a lot of the details in, in the turbulence, right? There is no rotating of vortex anymore and the small scale dynamics are completely missing. Uh, we also try to understand whether this model is indeed doing the multi-scale modeling as we hypothesize. Right, so in order to do that, we basically uh, did some ablation study on the TFNet 
So TFNet has three components, right? Representing temporal, spatial, and fluctuation. Once the model is trained, we can zero out the rest of the component, meaning we set the weights to be zero and only allow this model to generate forecasts for a particular component. And that basically generates the, the video for temporal, spatial, and fluctuation, right? So if I play the video for you, you can see that the fluctuation started to become pretty fast. You know, it learned from the model to separate the scale of the turbulence automatically from the input data, right? So let's play this again. You can see the temporal pattern is relatively stable and the spatial pattern is a little bit higher scale and fluctuation is a higher scale capturing the small scale dynamics. Okay, so that's basically the idea behind learning mathematical operators. Um, I think, you know, that's probably our first endeavor into, you know, physics guided learning or physics informed learning. Uh, the new direction that we're trying to push on, which is something really I'm very excited about, is a, a different type of physics guided learning paradigm, which we call the equivariant learning. So in equivariant learning, right, our goal is the generalization. As I showed before, you know, even when we can predict the turbulence at a quite fast speed, uh, if the model is only trained on a certain initial condition and a boundary condition. So a limitation of this type of work is that if we change the initial condition and the boundary condition of the data, most of the times the deep learning model will fail. So this is the fundamental challenge in machine learning. When we change the test data distribution, it, the performance will degrade significantly, right? So in order to really drive you know, the progress in AI to make general intelligence, we need models that can generalize to different distributions. So the interesting about modeling physical dynamics is our observation that even though the data distribution has changed from one to the other, the law of physics does not change. So if we can exploit this type of invariance from training to testing, we will be able to design more generalizable models. And that's the high level goal, actually high level idea of equivariant learning. So in Notice theorem, it provides a connection between the conservation laws and the symmetry. So if we want to learn a functional map that can basically be robust to distributional changes, we, may, we need to make it equivalent. So by definition, if a functional map, right, in this case, a map can be a forecaster. Uh, if we want it to be group equivalent with respect to a certain group, then what we need is that if an input is transformed by a certain group, rho of g, then we also expect the output to be sim transformed similarly by the same group. And this function, if satisfying this condition, it is equivalent with respect to this group. As an example, uh, we have a recent iClear paper this year about incorporating symmetries for generalization in deep dynamics models. Uh, this is the cool picture, just explaining the idea between equivariance. Equivariance. So given the velocity field, let us say the velocity field of turbulence, um, if we transform you know, this turbulence by a certain way and, and then shift by a certain way and then rotate by 45 degree, it is actually the same thing as we rotate this in the frame by 40 degree and then do the, the translation. So this kind of you know, similar outcome from different routes is the key idea behind equivariance. And this is done by my um, PhD student Right and postdoc Robin, who is still at North System. Um, so let's talk about symmetries, right? So symmetries are basically fundamental laws in physics, and uh, we can describe them with some group theory, right? In group, we know it's a set with a composition map, and for the set, the one identity is an element, and for every element in the set, it has an inverse operation. To be concrete, I think a rotation group is a familiar group, right? So for any operation that rotates an object, we can always represent them. We can always think them as a group because we can rotate the thing something back with a reverse angle. 
right? So a representation is a matrix representation of the group. It has to satisfy this property called group of homomorphism, which means if I rotate, you know, two things, if I rotate two, twice, it's the same thing as I, I rotate by, if I rotate 30 degree twice, it's the same as I rotate 60 degrees. And that's basically the, you know, the idea behind group homomorphism. So uh, it's basically a linear map, which is a, a matrix. Right? On a vector space, we can realize them by matrices. Um, it's important to remember that even for the same group, we can represent them with different uh, matrices or different group representations. Let's say we're looking at the cyclic group of four, order four, right? We can either represent them where we rotate this red dot by 90 degree, and this becomes a two by two matrix. So this is a row two representation of the cyclic group. We can also permute the index in a certain way, right? Such that it achieves the same effect as the rotation. And this becomes a four by four matrix as a permutation matrix. So this is a row four representation. So this is an example of different representations for the same group. So in order to learn an equivalent function, right, just to, to uh, recap, we have a function from Rn to Rm, um, and we have a group G. So we want to learn a function f that is basically equivalent. So uh, the example I gave is say the function is scaling, right? We scale the velocity field by two and we rotate 45 degree. It's the same thing as I rotate 45 degree and scale the velocity field. So to build an equivalent neural network, right? We basically want the neural network to approximate this function. In order to do that, we need to make sure that this entire input output map is equivalent. So the input representation and the output representation are fixed because they're defined by our data and the labels. And so we cannot change anything, but we can do a lot of things about the intermediate hidden layers and the activation functions. So if we design the intermediate layers and the hidden at the activation functions to be equivalent, then the entire network is equivalent. We proved this idea in our paper, also including the residual connections. This proposition states that if a map between layers is equivalent, then the entire network is equivalent. Even adding six skip connections with residual network doesn't affect its equivalent with respect to linear actions. So we implement equivalent neural network through way sharing. The, the high level idea is that we know, for example, convolutional neural networks are translation invariant because the filters are shared from different positions. And we can extend similar ideas to other type of symmetry groups. So there's a more general theorem proved by Weiler and Cesar in 19, um, which gives the sufficient and necessary condition for a convolutional layer to be G equivalent to arbitrary group symmetry groups. And essentially saying that if a kernel satisfy a condition where we can left multiply the inverse of the group representation and right multiply the group representation itself, then this convolutional layer is equivalent. So we leverage the theorem and design various equivalent neural networks for forecasting physical dynamics, such as rotation equivalent, we can design the representation with rotation matrix. And then for uniform motion, we have similar strategy. For skill equivalent, we have to be careful because when dealing with some physical dynamics, it's important to differentiate between uh, the actual physics scale of the physics versus the resolution of the video. So to separate these two, right, for the resolution of video, we use the conjugation of uh, a scale by dividing uh, the mean, uh, subtracting the mean, and divide by standard deviation. For the physical scale, we design similar type of group convolution to basically ensure that the convolutional layer is G equivalent. Back to the original goal of the, the, the paper, right? We wanted to design a model that is able to generalize to a very different distribution. So this is the test that we did to justify, to test the validated hypothesis. So basically we train our model in certain 
you know, road angles or scales of the turbulence. And then we change the test data by road either rotating or scaling or do certain kind of group per transformation on test data, right? So for rotation, the non-equivariant models will see the rotated turbulence as a completely different distribution and therefore cannot predict the turbulence very well. So that's, this is the, this is the you know, prediction for non-equivariant models. But for equivariant models, it can recognize, right, so let me play this video again. Then you can see that the equivariant models is able to uh, detect the change in the test distribution and correctly reflect the rotation the transformation. Similarly, for uniform motion and the scaling, we can see that the equivariant models are robust against group transformations. So for ocean current forecasting, we evaluate on the ocean current reanalysis data. The left plot shows uh, the energy, the RMSE of the forecasting um, method for uh, our model, res, uh, scale equivariant ResNet and the non-equivariant counterpart, the ResNet. Right? We can see that when we scale the test data of different factors, the non-equivariant model, which is in gray color, will have exponential growth of the error because the model will think the scaled up test data have very different distribution as a training data. But for equivariant models, it's able to learn this group transformation and ensure the invariance in the prediction. So you can see that the forecasting error is not changing that much as expected. And similarly, we can see that the energy spectrum error is also very robust against this kind of changes. So with equivariance or with built-in symmetry, we can, ensure, we can encourage the generalization of various deep learning models to complete a different distribution on the group transformation. So we have another paper at iClear as well about using symmetries to forecast the trajectory of the autonomous vehicles. And I also encourage you to check it out. Okay, to conclude, today I have talked about uh, some ideas that we have generated in order to model spatial temporal data. Uh, the high level overarching theme is that we want to incorporate physical principles in deep dynamics models. So, we talked about two group of methods. One is trainable operators, such that we replace the mathematical operators with trainable weights, and we apply these methods to COVID-19 forecasting, as well as um, turbulence forecasting. The other group of methods is called equivariant learning. This is trying to incorporate symmetries into a deep learning model in order to guarantee loss of conservation. So we apply this kind of model to turbulence forecasting and ocean current forecasting tasks. So in terms of future work, there's a lot still need to be done, right? We're actually actively working on uh, other directions such as considering the stochasticity in the dynamics uh, for simulation, as well as the multi-agent interactions. Um, I would like to thank, uh, I guess before that, I wanted to show you where you can find the code and the data. It's all on my website or the group GitHub. Uh, you can also follow me on Twitter where I run sometimes update with the news uh, from our group. And then I would like to thank the support from various funding agencies and uh, government and companies. Uh, their work has supported uh, a lot of this research. So finally, I want to share this quote, which I often like to think about. Um, Einstein said, time and space are not conditions of existence. Time and space is just a model thinking. Right, by working in space and time data, it has got me think a lot about what to do uh, in machine learning. And I hope my talk today can also get you to think a little bit more uh, in the space and time, All right? Thank you. Thank you again, Rose. Uh, in fact, it was interesting you brought that uh, last paper up because uh, uh, I, uh, Greg Versteeg, Aram Galastin, and uh, Martin Abram, who's uh, here in the talk, uh, are, uh, we're inspired by that and, and we're looking at your work because we're doing work on physical vapor deposition and part of our work had been thinking about can we predict these very intensive simulations uh, with AI. Uh, when we're looking at your, your last paper, uh, we were noticing uh, one potential critique, which is that um, it is this equivariant method uh, 
is a bit slower than say data augmentation uh, and of similar uh, predictive power mm -hmm. uh, or sorry, and similar accuracy. So um, we were wondering uh, what would be the, the, the greatest utility? I, I assume this is most useful for uh, cases for which we, um, we lack a lot of data to augment or, or for which we do not have many um, uh, cases with, with different orientations or with different translations, would that be correct? Great question. Let me just share this slide that I haven't been able to talk about. This is exactly about a comparison between data augmentation versus symmetry. It is true that sometimes people use data augmentation because it's easy, but what we found is that in effect with equivariance, it actually achieves lower error in forecasting for different time domain as well as different space domain, especially mm -hmm. for scale, you know, a different scale of the turbulence. So in terms of computation, in fact, because it's just calculating, right, the, com the group convolution, the complexity is very similar to uh, regular convolution once we define the representations. Um, mm -hmm. So another, I think another argument for using equivariant model versus the data augmentation is for, especially for like continuous groups, because let's say scale, you know, or kind of SO2 group, where you cannot basically sample across a continuous space of angles or scale to have all possible augmented data. And that's where symmetry is naturally fit in. That makes sense. Uh, in, in any case, uh, let me go to the question so I don't uh, uh, avoid people who have very, very good questions as well. Um, so uh, a question that uh, Julian Emily uh, Gay asked was, uh, what is the convergence rate of the uh, CIs you obtained for COVID-19 prediction? Uh, I actually don't understand the question. Maybe I'm just not an expert in I, the domain itself. Uh, perhaps uh, Julian means, uh, how quickly can you determine the confidence intervals uh, when, when doing error quantification? Uh, you were mentioning how you're doing error quantification for COVID-19 uh, networks. I guess she was wondering, how quickly can you determine those confidence intervals? Uh, and, no, and that's not the question. Okay. The, the, the question is about coverage rate, not convergence. Oh, sorry, I misread that. Um, so the coverage, the coverage rate is if you have, uh, if you construct something that has, like you construct a 95% confidence interval, the idea is that you actually want 95% of the data to fall into that interval, uh, or you want the data to fall into that 95% of the time. Mm -hmm. um, so in other words, you want accurate confidence intervals. And you showed two methods that had very different width of confidence intervals. Uh, so I was wondering you know, how you determine the coverage rates for those and whether that would help you distinguish between the two methods. Oh, I see. Very good question. So I finally understand. So yeah, I, mean, I didn't show this in the, in the talk, but you know, we have a metric that we reported in the paper, uh, which is called mean interval score. Uh, so it basically quantifies the coverage um, as well as the interval size, right? Uh, between of this uh, UQ methods. And what we saw is that, you know, if actually we use that metric itself as a loss function, we achieve the best of both. Like the, you know, but, but we want the, data to fall inside of the interval, right? That's what coverage rate. At the same time, we also don't want the interval to be too big, right? And that, you know, that shows less confidence. So MIS is a metric that quantifies both things. And if we use that function as a loss function, we can actually have the highest accuracy or performance on that metric. Great, thank you. Now I noticed we're, we're uh, over time. So I just want to be very quick with one more question. Uh, or, or it looks like, uh, uh, so Julian uh, asked another question, which was for turbulence, the model seems to be great at capturing steady state behavior. Have you tried this with uh, transient uh, perturbations, for example, eddy growth or decay? Yeah, wonderful. So yeah, this paper, it is about, say, you know, it's a circular, it's a kind of periodic pattern, right? So that's not surprising that deep learning model can learn it. Uh, the new work that we did for the 3D turbulence is actually non-stationary. Uh, we have seen, you know, promising results, and I can share with you the paper afterwards if you're interested. Awesome. All right. Um, since we're out of time, I don't want to keep people, but um, 
it's, it's a pleasure to talk to you, Rose, and I think I'll have a couple papers and, and discussions to have with you afterwards uh, as, we, as we think about new research and new research ideas. Um, but with Absolutely. that, uh, it's, it's uh, great to hear from you, and uh, I think we can uh, stop the recording, uh, and we will